If you're thinking about buying your first laser engraver, whether for yourself or as a gift, I've got some essential information you can't afford to miss. Choosing the right laser isn't just about price, it's about making sure you get the one that fits your needs. So what do you need to know before you buy? Stick around because I'm going to share the top things every first time laser buyer must know and an awesome resource to get you up and running in no time. Let's dive into the types of lasers you need to understand before making your purchase decision. Each laser type has its strengths and weaknesses, and we're gonna cover the key things you need to know about them before you hit the buy button. The three main types of lasers most consumers purchase are diode lasers, CO2 lasers, and galvofiber lasers. And each of these types have strengths and weaknesses. Each laser type has a range of cutting areas that dictate how large of an item you can cut or engrave. And there are different price points for each laser type, which we will talk about as well. Let's start with a type that usually has the lowest price point. Many beginners often start with this style of laser, and I'm no exception. My first ever laser was a diode that bolted onto a tiny little 3018 CNC frame, and after that, I was hooked. We call them diode lasers because they have a laser module containing one or more laser diodes that are combined together to create the cutting beam. These units typically last many thousands of hours if treated well. The average working area for diode lasers is around 400 by 400 millimeters. Some laser models can be upgraded to have larger working areas, but the ability to upgrade the size is based on what style of diode laser you get. Diodes typically come in two styles, open frame or enclosed. Open frame diode lasers can be really inexpensive, starting between $300 and $400 for an open frame laser. But if you're going to get an open frame laser, there are some important safety requirements that you need to know about. First, regardless of what laser type you buy, you will need to vent it outside of your workspace. These devices will make a lot of smoke and can release gases from the material that you do not want to be breathing. I use a centrifugal fan and dust extraction piping to vent out through the wall here in my workspace. If you are getting an open frame diode, you will need to get an enclosure to contain the smoke and fumes. Hook that up to an extraction system and you're good to go. But fume extraction isn't the only thing an enclosure does. If you are getting a closed diode laser like this Creality Falcon Pro 2, then you don't need an enclosure. You only need an extraction fan. And while most enclosed lasers come with an extraction fan built in, they are not strong enough to expel the smoke fast enough. You really need a high CFM fan like I showed earlier. But enclosures aren't just for containing the fumes. Diodes run in the 420-ish nanometer wavelength range, and at time of filming, you can get diode lasers from five to 60 watts in power. You don't wanna be staring at the blue laser light the entire time it's running, because it's putting off UV rays that can lead to eye problems. Using an enclosure will protect your eyes from these UV rays in addition to containing smoke and fumes. And the wavelength I mentioned determines what materials you can cut and engrave. But before I talk about what materials each laser type can cut and engrave, let's talk about the learning curve. We've all heard that learning something new can be a challenge, but how steep is the learning curve with a laser engraver? And what's the best way to shorten it? A laser engraver can pose a bit of a learning curve, especially if you've never used a CNC machine before. It requires special software on the computer to control the laser. Plus, you need to learn what settings work best for your specific material and the material you are working with. And I have good news. I created a course dedicated to getting started with diode lasers. I cover everything from unpacking and assembling a laser to creating your first custom project. It has everything you need to know to get started with a new diode laser in less than a day. And as an added bonus, if you get my course now, you'll receive version two for free when it releases. I'm adding some cool stuff in version two, like using a rotary for round objects and setting up a camera with your laser to speed up your workflow. You can find a link to my course in the description below. Now that the learning curve is manageable, let's talk about one laser you should avoid buying. CO2 lasers have a large glass tube filled with carbon dioxide and some other gases, which is why we call them CO2 lasers. The tube is usually located in the back of the machine. High voltage is used to excite gases inside the sealed tube producing the laser beam. The lifespan of the CO2 tube will vary depending on what kind it is, how hard it's run, and how long it's been sitting around. A conservative estimate is about 1500 hours of use. But before we go much further with CO2 lasers, there is an important topic I need to talk about. There are small sub $500 lasers that have a 40 watt CO2 laser source and a small, usually eight by 12 ish inch or 300 by 200 millimeter working space. Many of them won't work with light burn, which is the industry standard for laser cutting and engraving control software. These small units are often referred to as K40 lasers, and while it might seem like an attractive choice for a beginner due to the price, let me tell you why I wouldn't recommend it. 
Unless you only plan to cut or engrave very small pieces, you will quickly outgrow a K40. For comparison, over here I have my Xtool P2 desktop CO2 laser. It has a working area of 23 inches by 12 inches or 58 by 30 centimeters. I'll leave links in the description to videos where I use all the different lasers I mentioned in this video. And even this laser is on the small side in terms of working area, but there's a reason for that. The Xtool P2 is a competitor to the Glowforge. I do not recommend Glowforge because it's all proprietary and you're locked into using their software, plus they're also more expensive. Not to say that this P2 is inexpensive, but you get more bang for your buck getting a non-Glowforge CO2 laser. These types of CO2 lasers are meant to be smaller and not take up as much space as floor standing CO2 lasers. The trade-off is you have a smaller working area on a desktop CO2 laser. And as I mentioned, there are also floor standing CO2 lasers with much larger working spaces. I don't have one here because I'm limited on space, but I have used them in the past. They can range from 50 watt up to 200 plus watt laser sources with enough space to pass full sheets of plywood or acrylic through the working area. Of course, this size and power comes at a cost. CO2 lasers can range from $1,500 up to tens of thousands of dollars, depending on size, power, and manufacturer. But they do have one big advantage over diode lasers that we'll talk about in a minute. First, let's round out our laser types by talking about one of the coolest lasers, or what I think is one of the coolest lasers. Often coveted by many laser enthusiasts because it can deeply engrave and cut thin metal, this laser type has one huge advantage over the other two. Which brings me to a downside of diodes and CO2 lasers. They cannot cut or engrave on metal. They can mark metal, and some infrared diode laser modules can, let's say, scratch the surface of metal, but none of them compare to the ability of a fiber laser. That being said, if you're hoping to cut through really thick metal stock, I've got some bad news. You're going to need an industrial gantry fiber laser to do that, and those are not cheap. Like, cost more than a house not cheap. And engraving on metal is really a fiber laser shining ability. They're also able to make colors on stainless steel more reliably and with greater range than a diode laser. Although I will say you'll want to get a MOPA fiber laser if your main goal is to color stainless steel. It's a lot easier, and you have more control over the colors with a MOPA fiber. The GI30 I have here in my shop is a MOPA fiber laser. I'll leave a link in the description to a video where I use it to color stainless steel. Alpha fibers start around $2,000 for a 20 watt model, but at time of filming, there are some you can get for less than that due to holiday sales. Typical power range from Galvo fibers is from 20 to 200 watts. There is a downside though. Galvo fiber lasers working areas are much smaller than diodes or CO2 lasers. The working area can range from around 110 by 110 millimeters to 200 by 200 millimeters. This Guayki Cloud G2 Pro is a 30 watt fiber laser and has a working area of 150 by 150 millimeters. And I also have an awesome combo unit that has both a 20 watt diode and a 20 watt fiber laser combined. I'm talking about the F1 Ultra that I just got and I'll have several videos featuring it and the G2 Pro in the future. And if you're watching this in the future, check the description for links to those videos. Both the G2 Pro and the F1 Ultra are portable and they are great for taking to craft or vendor fairs for on the spot customization of products. And if you're only in this for the hobby and you don't care about craft fairs, these units are great if you are tight on space. And while those are some of the benefits to fiber lasers, we need to talk about the limitations. Before we dive into the limitations of the lasers, I have to tell you about two items you must get if you're going to be working with lasers. We're using lasers to cut flammable materials and eventually you will catch something on fire. Be sure you have a fire extinguisher nearby and never, I mean never, leave a running laser unattended. Don't ask me how I know. You can pick up dry chemical fire extinguishers at most hardware stores, but be aware that these extinguishers can cause damage to your laser, which is why I recommend the second item. This is a fire blanket. It's a quick, easy way to put out fires without using an extinguisher. Mine hangs right here on the table beneath my lasers, so I can quickly grab it if needed. That being said, if you do have a fire and need to use the extinguisher, please do. It is not worth risking your workshop, garage, or home because you're afraid of damaging your laser engraver. Go out and buy a fire extinguisher. So what is each laser type good at cutting and engraving? Both lasers are great on organic materials such as wood and leather. A diode laser can cut and engrave some acrylics if they are opaque enough, but they will not cut or engrave clear acrylic. Well, you can engrave clear acrylic with a diode using a simple trick, but you can't cut clear acrylic. I'll leave a link in the description to my video on engraving clear acrylic with a diode laser. If you want to cut clear acrylic, you will need a CO2 laser. The same goes for engraving glass. You can cheat it on a diode laser, but it's much easier with a CO2 laser. 
And while both diodes and CO2s can mark on some metals with preparation, a fiber laser is the way to go if you want to deeply engrave metals. All three lasers can also work on slate, which is a really popular material. A drawback to fiber lasers is that they won't work on wood or clear acrylic. Fiber lasers won't work well with most organic materials. And the question I see all the time is, how many watts should I get? And the answer I give is, as much as your budget will allow. The more power your laser has, the faster your jobs can get done, and the thicker the material you can cut through. But don't feel like you have to have the highest power laser you can buy. I got along fine with a 5 watt laser for over a year before I upgraded to a 20 watt. In fact, right now, the highest wattage laser I have is the P2, which is 55 watts. When deciding on which laser to get, it comes down to what you, or the person you're buying the laser for, wants to do with it. Start with the end goal in mind, then use the advice I mentioned in this video to help determine what type of laser is right for you or the person you're buying it for. I'll have links to all the videos I mentioned as well as all the lasers and a few other goodies in the video description down below. And if you want more information about getting started with a diode laser, check out my video here that talks about how your diode laser is trying to kill you. Thanks for watching.